Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Joe Chris, and I'm from the not-for-profit social enterprise Opus Independence that coordinates the Festival of Debate. Now, the Festival of Debate is an annual program that we run from Sheffield that brings communities together to discuss new ideas that shape our understanding of the world. Tonight is actually our penultimate event uh, for the Festival of Debate, so. Uh, our second to last of the sort of 48 uh, live streams and 15 short commission videos that we've been making over the last few months and I'm very excited about it. It's one of the ones that I've been most looking forward to. Now all festival of debate events are free at the point of access to make sure they're as accessible to a wide range of audiences as possible but we do rely on donations from audience members to help us make it happen. If you can afford and are in a position to support us and the work that we do um, that would be much appreciated and you can do that by clicking on the PayPal link which I'll share in the chat shortly or by visiting www.festivalofdebate.com where you can also watch again a lot of our previous events with people such as Yanis Varoufakis, David Lamy and many many others. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce our chair for tonight's event and um, please welcome Chiwei. Hello and welcome to tonight's event, Democracy in Crisis with Peter Gagan, Neil Lawson and Kleiner Jordan. Democracy in the UK runs skin deep. The various crises that the UK has faced over the past few years has called into question the very functioning of how our society is governed. This live stream would take aim at our democratic system itself, discussing how our democracy functions. Tonight's first guest is Peter Gagan, a writer, broadcaster, and investigations editor at an award-winning news website, Open Democracy. Peter led Open Democracy's investigations into dark money in British politics that were nominated for a 2019 British Journalism Award and the Paul Foot Award. His most recent book, Democracy for Sale, Dark Money and Dirty Politics was published in August 2020 by Head of Zeus. Good evening, Peter, and welcome to the Festival of Debate. Good evening, Chiwe, and thank you so much for having me. This is, I feel incredibly honoured. This was something that was supposed to happen last summer too. Unfortunately, it's not in person, but I'm so pleased. I was so delighted to get the invite from Joe again. So thank you very much. And I hope you've, everyone's had a really fantastic festival debate. And I feel very honored to be part of the penultimate session. Lovely to have you. I'll go straight into it, Peter, and ask you, could you tell us why you first started investigating dark money and how it's affecting our democratic system? Yes, well, to be honest, if you'd said to me a few years ago, you're going to spend most of your time researching dark money in politics and money in politics, I would have been as surprised as you are in some respects. You know, my, my previous book was about the Scottish independence referendum, and I'm, I'm speaking to you here from Glasgow. Um, but actually, I stumbled upon this story in many respects. It was in the run-up to the Brexit referendum, if people can remember, in the dim and distant past, back in June of 2016, I was working as a reporter for the Irish Times, and I was in the town of Sunderland doing that thing that reporters do before a big election. It was a few days before the Brexit vote, and I was off in Sunderland talking to people about Brexit and about how they thought they were going to vote. And as I was leaving, I was leaving from a suburban train station to get the train back up the road. And I was in the train station. I picked up a copy of the free newspaper, the, the Metro, which many I'm sure many of the viewers are still familiar with. And it had a big advert in the front of it. It said, take back control. And if you, again, if you can remember, that was the slogan of the official leave campaign. But um, I kind of noticed the font was kind of strange. The color was different. And I flipped it over and I noticed that it had the logo of the Democratic Unionist Party on the back, the DUP, the Northern Irish Unionist Party. And it said that the advert was paid for by the DUP. I thought, that's really interesting. You know, I used to work as a reporter in Belfast. What's the DUP doing buying ads in Sunderland in a newspaper in England? This makes no sense. So anyway, I did a, the other thing that journalists do these days. I took a picture of it, sent a tweet, and then got on the train and had to start filing my copy for the next day's paper. And I kind of forgot all about it. But I was always kind of nagging me in the back of my mind. I was like, what's going on with that? And I knew that political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret due to this law, an old law, arcane law, in many ways a hangover from the troubles. You know, but political donors in Northern Ireland, it was, wasn't safe to publish their names. So I started wondering, I wonder, has somebody kind of taken, used that loophole to funnel money into DUP's Brexit campaign? And months later, you know, Sunderland became a bit of a, a cause celebre for Brexit, but many months later, it kind of kept on nagging at me. 
And myself and Adam Ramsey uh, at Open Democracy started looking into it. We published a big investigation and we found out that, yes, indeed, a huge sum of money, almost £500,000, had been funneled through the Democratic Unionist Party, DUP, for its Brexit referendum campaign. It had come from a really shady organisation uh, based uh, outside of Glasgow, and from a, a kind of a pebble dash house outside Glasgow, and we had no idea where the money came from. And that started me asking questions. I started thinking, what? Well, how often does this happen in British politics? How easy is it to get access into British politics? And what does money buy? And in many ways, I'm still trying to answer those questions. You know, I, I wrote that book last year. I still don't know who gave the, the DP uh, all that money. So if anybody listening knows, please do get in touch. But more generally, I found as uh, almost a proliferation of questions around money in politics, actually. You know, we're just speaking today when Peter Crudus, who um, is now Lord Crudus, a big Tory donor, who Boris Johnson put into the House of Lords against, explicitly against advice from the Appointments Committee. We found out today with new election returns that he gave the Tory party half a million pounds just days after he's pushed into the House of Lords. So we get some idea of what money buys you in British politics. But that was a kind of terrain I started wanting to map out. I wanted to try and understand how does money influence our politics? How do things like anonymously funded think tanks shape our debate? How easy is it uh, to kind of to, to shift um, the debate within British politics? And one of the things I started off doing was when I came to this subject, I thought, look, Britain's nowhere like America. It's nowhere near as bad. You need huge sums of money in American politics. You don't need that much in Britain. You know, the last American presidential election, the one that was held in November, cost billions of dollars. Even state legislature elections can cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, it costs huge amounts of money. Whereas in Britain, if you give £50,000 to Conservative Party every year, you become a member of what's called the Leaders Group of Tory donors. And uh, that's the kind of thing that like, you're able to get this huge amount of access that you wouldn't have otherwise for very small amounts of money. So that was the thing I started finding out. And that's really been the reason I think we have to really think about the role of money in our democracy, because small amounts of money can make a huge difference. Right. Thanks, Peter. So I think metaphorically, we all talk about following where the money, uh, following the money trail, but you've literally been doing that. That's quite interesting. Uh, maybe a follow on question to that would be, could you tell us how this actual system of dark money influencing politics has come to be? Is it a result of um, historically our political system has developed over the time or is it just a more recent development? Well, it might be good to start by asking, what is dark money? You know, it's one of those phrases you throw around and people ask, what does it mean? And basically, it's a, it's a kind of neologism. It's a new word that comes from America, really. And it means money that enters the political system anonymously. And we don't know where it comes from. And I think that's a really big, big issue. Um, because we can see money come, money comes into the political system and we don't, we don't, we don't see where. So, and it can be everything from what a kind of shady funding vehicles that can give money to, to political parties, mainly in Britain, the Conservative Party. So it's quite easy because our laws are so lax to give money to political parties in a very unaccountable way. So if I wanted to give money to political party almost anonymously, I'd set up a thing called an unincorporated association. Sounds really grand, but actually it hasn't, doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to file accounts, doesn't have to say who the members are, and doesn't have to say where its money comes from. So that's one way in which uh, in which we're kind of getting, you can kind of start to see that. But another way as well is things like, I look at things like my book, things like think tanks, so anonymously funded think tanks, which can have a huge impact on our debate. Organizations like the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Adam Smith Institute, they don't declare who their donors are, but they can have a big influence on debate. And another factor that I kind of look at as well is this rise of online advertisement on Facebook and things like that, which I'm sure people have seen. It's really easy to, uh, to advertise anonymously. So in many ways, these are lots of different ways in which what we call dark money influencer politics. Some are less, are, are quite old. You know, the idea of anonymous funding for political parties in many ways goes back a long way. But some of these new things like the use of technology, and I would argue the use of kind of corporate funded, anonymously funded right wing think tanks has really changed in recent years. So, you know, really we're talking about this shift from almost an analog way of doing politics to a digital way of doing politics. And I think that's allowed far more for proliferation of dark money and allowed dark money to influence political debate and discussion in ways that we probably didn't see before. Thanks, Peter. Um, right. Very interesting. Now, um, 
So, so, so what does that actually uh, say? Does the role of dark money in politics mean that our political system is fundamentally swayed to represent vested interests as opposed to citizens then in that case? I think that's one of the questions we have to ask. You know, if if money buys access, buys privileged access to political power, and we've seen a lot of questions around that um, going on in recent years. We've seen a lot of questions about how money can buy access into politics, and we, I think fundamentally we are at a at a point where you can you can look at look at all the COVID the contracts for COVID work that were given out to significant party donors of the Conservative Party over the last eighteen months. You know, I started writing about that almost well, you know, well over a year ago, and that's continuing to go on so we can see we actually know from people like the good law projects disclosures of court documents we can see how funders and donors have a privileged access to politics so that's one part of it that's almost like a cronyism if you want to call it that or a corruption of politics where you get access and it gives you uh, it gives you access to, to the state apparatus to provide as as we've hollowed out the state as well as that we you know more and more work is outsourced to private sector so that's really that's a big part of it. And the other aspect as well is in which the kind of broader um, kind of alliance of corporate interests and the way corporate interests can switch can sway our politics. So, you know, I mentioned think tanks earlier, but these I find these are very interesting because, you know, think tanks look and sound as if they are kind of neutral academic bodies. But a lot of the kind of think tanks you will see represented in the media groups like the Institute of Economic Affairs are actually funded by corporate organizations, BP, um, Philip Morris has funded a number of these groups too. And they will produce what looks like independent research, but actually is often talking points that come from corporate interests. And it's very easy to get that into the media. They can get huge media traction and then from there influence political debate and influence policy. So I do think there's a real problem with this. And I think people see this, people sense it, and the failure to do anything about it, and in many ways actually to foster it. I think we've seen it being fostered heavily by this current government, only adds to the distance that people feel between politics and um, and the world around them. Right, lovely. Thanks. So I think this, uh, this dovetails really well into the last question that I had for you for now, Peter. Um, Corporate, corporate lobbying, um, as you've just we've just been talking about, has just recently been highlighted by David Cameron's role in lobbying for the investment firm uh, Greensill. So what type of legislation do you think is needed to help limit the role that corporate lobbyists can play in, um, in trying to influence policy? In well, there's lots of things we could do about this. We And in many ways, the David Cameron scandal was a scandal waiting to happen because the lobbying legislation that he had brought in himself in during his time in government, I think it was in 2015, was so poor. So there's lots of ways you could tighten up the lobbying registration legislation as it exists. That's really not that difficult. But there's loads of other things we could do too. We could do things like make freedom of information actually work. You know, I do a lot of work on FOI. The FOI system is anyone who's listening to try to send an FOI, especially the central government, it basically doesn't work. You are getting stonewalled and blanked at every single turn. If you change that, you could actually understand, you know, what, who, what lobbyists are talking about to politicians about. And also, I think there's, if we took money more seriously out of British politics, at the moment, there's no ceiling on donations. So corporate entities can give effectively unlimited money to British party politics. And that, you know, that should change. I think it wouldn't be hard to say have a ceiling of £10,000 on an individual or a corporate donor, and that would quite quickly change it. So there's lots of things that could be done to change that system. It's not hard. Lots of other countries do it better than we do it. The problem is the political will to actually want to do it. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, quite a lot of information. And uh, before I let you go, just to remind everybody, whatever platform it is you're using, start typing your questions. We've got people monitoring all the platforms and uh, they'll be bringing the questions in for the Q&A session later. Um, thank you very much, Peter. And really happy to introduce our next, uh, our second speaker, Kleiner Jordan, who is the co-chief executive of Make Votes Matter. Makes Vote Matter is the cross-parliamentary uh, cross campaign for proportional representation. Good evening, Kleiner, and welcome to Festival of Debate. Good evening, Julie. It's lovely to be here with you, and uh, I love the title of this talk in particular. <laughs> I wish I could take responsibility for it, but thank you. <laughs> um, Kleiner, what is the Make Votes Matter campaign, and why do you think proportional representation will help improve our democracy? Sure. So, um, 
basically, I think the starting point is that we don't yet have proper democracy in the UK. Um, so that's my, my personal opinion. I know a lot of colleagues and our supporters would agree with that. Um, so we could say that proportional representation is, is basic democracy. Um, Make Price Matter is the uh, kind of the spearhead of the national movement for proportional representation in the UK. Um, and we're a single issue campaign for that um, and work with lots of organisations like uh, Compass, uh, Neil Leeds um, and uh, yeah, many other democracy organisations, um, political parties, uh, other organisations, public figures, etc. To, to bring about that change. Um, and there's obviously a lot of grassroots movement uh, that happens as well. Um, so just to go back to the, the point about um, democracy in the UK, um, democracy comes from the Greek words demos and kratos, which means people, power. And um, we've got a system, first past the post, which is the, the way of counting our votes, which means that we can have wrong winner elections. So that's happened twice in the last century or so, um, where one time the Tories got into power when Labour had more votes and one time the other way around. And so to me, that's clearly not the people being in power. And there are all sorts of other effects of first past the post, like completely disproportionate outcomes, Not maybe if they're not as extreme as the wrong winner elections, but they're also really significant. So it's basically a system that gives a false advantage to the two biggest parties. So it creates a kind of two party system, which is very oppositional, binary and um, combative. And, and as some people probably know, the uh, House of Commons was designed to be specifically two swords lengths apart. So it's, it's all about fighting. It kind of goes back to feudalism, really. Um, and so we need to take that basic next step to a democracy where our votes are all counted equally. And if a party gets 20 percent of the vote, they get 20 percent of the seats. So it seems obvious. And in fact, a lot of people assume that that is what happens when it completely isn't what happens. And um, in other countries, uh, like the vast majority of democracies already use systems of proportional representation. Um, it's just a, a, a quite a small number, but of quite large countries that use first past the post. And they're basically all ex-colonies um, that we gave this horrible colonial export to. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's the kind of the, the, the basics about proportional representation and our campaign. Um, but the good news is that um, we're making a huge amount of progress in towards changing this. People have been campaigning for it for well over 130 years in this country. Um, but we're seeing a kind of a snowballing effect in the last few years. And um, a key part of that is getting one of the two big parties on board. So we've already got all of the opposition parties aside from Labour on board. And we're really hopeful that we might be able to get them to support proportional representation at this year's conference as well. So that's really key. And obviously having the kind of the big grassroots demand for it is, is part of that as well. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kleiner. And I'm pretty sure that the, as questions start com coming in, there's going to be lots of reflection around the Labour Party's uh, engagement with you. So I'll skip that because that's a question that I would like to ask, but I'll wait. Um, perhaps you could speak more to uh, this bit. So critics of proportional representation say that its adoption could result in, in far-right parties having representation in Parliament and that it might make it harder for governments to make decisions how would you respond to that? That's a good one. It's one of the, the, the key ones. And yes, proportional representation results in people being proportionally represented. Um, and so generally there's a, a natural threshold. So you won't get a, a kind of a tiny, tiny fringe party, which is getting a really tiny percentage of the vote managing to get representation. But um, if, if the party is getting, you know, if, you know, 3%, 5% of the vote, my view is that they should be represented to that level in Parliament. And the thing about that is that bring it into the sunlight. Sunlight is the best disinfectant and Parliament is the place for putting arguments under scrutiny. It should be. And so if you've got somebody coming up with something that is actually not factually correct, that can be challenged in Parliament. Whereas if people are saying those things outside of Parliament, then they can create a lot of media noise about it. And I'm sure we're all aware of things like that that have happened in recent years. 
but it's it's not challenged in the right way. And so the resentment that that view isn't being represented in Parliament grows and grows, whilst the proper conversation about whether that's a real thing isn't actually happening. Um, so I think bring it into the light and, and let's have those conversations. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, those conversations, um, I suppose, would mean getting more people engaged, uh, communities engaged or involved in campaigning uh, for engaging with proportional representation. How are you doing this? How are you getting people to get involved? So we've got a really flourishing grassroots movement. Um, it's quite exciting, particularly lately, there's more and more local groups starting. Um, and so they take action around the country, obviously over the last year and a bit, that's um, largely been online, but um, we're getting offline as well. So we've got a big action day coming up on the 17th of July. Um, so that's gonna be make some noise for PR, um, which people can interpret however they want. We know some people are going to be doing songs about democracy. Um, we might have an Icelandic style pots and pans revolution where everyone goes and bashes pots around Parliament and <laughs> tells them to sort things out. <laughs> we, we will see, it might be a brass band. Um, so I think that's going to be quite exciting. But we, we've done a lot of stuff even while lockdown was happening, like socially distanced actions, even a banner drop, drop off uh, Westminster Bridge. So yeah, there's a lot of ex exciting things to get involved with. Lovely. I think um, you've just spoken to um, you've just spoken to this concept of the of a cultural wave around the campaign, that, and then that that quite excites me. Uh, I'm going to bring in that labour question that I thought I would ask you later. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, of course we know that a lot of uh, progressive parties in the UK, not just in the UK but also around Europe, have come out in favour of proportional representation, but not the Labour. And I also know that you you have some alliances there within the Labour Party. But why do you think it is that the Labour Party is just sitting on the fence on this? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, so we, we do work with lots of other organisations. So we've got the PR Alliance, which is fully cross party. But over the last year, we've also um, been running, uh, well, we are part of and helping drive the change in Labour for a New Democracy, um, which uh, Compass is also a, a member of. And um, that's very much focused on trying to bring about change from inside the Labour Party. So it's all run by Labour members. Um, and we've had this fantastic, uh, just like hundreds of, of, of motions from constituency Labour parties going to the central party. So we're now over a third of CLPs have passed these kind of motions. Um, and we're getting more unions coming on board recently as left past policy for this. Um, and so that's, that's really exciting because the unions are key to bringing about the change as well. Um, and we've yeah got all sorts of public figures, including parliamentarians involved in that. Um, so it really feels like it's possible. But your question is about um, <laughs> why isn't Labour already backing this, basically? And, and, and to me, it seems obvious they should because PR actually results in better outcomes, better social, environmental and economic outcomes. And so bearing in mind what Labour's policies are, they it seems like a good fit. However, first past the post, as I said earlier, uh, creates this um, false uh, uh, advantage for the two biggest parties. So historically, Labour has benefited from this. It's actually been less the case in, in recent years. Um, but what it's generally meant, and, and this is a, a bias from first past the post that you see around the world, it results in more right wing outcomes than the people of the country are voting for. And so normally the Tories are in power. So um, in uh, 19 of the last 20 elections, most voters have voted for parties to the left of the Tories. And yet the Tories are in power, have been in power about two thirds of the time. So you would think that Labour would see this and say, OK, this really isn't working for us anymore. Let's change it. But there's a lot of um, kind of stick, stick in the muds, let's call them, <laughs> in the party 
who historically knew that it benefited them and um, they don't want to share power. They want full socialism. So they want to get into power and bring about these kind of broad sweeping changes. And they think they're going to make the country wonderful. But the reality is they're not going to get into power with the current situation. And actually, power should be shared. This is kind of the whole point of our campaign. All vo voices should be equal. Um, all votes should have the same power, the same value. And, and so we have to learn to get to get 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 on together and collaborate like adults like we need to figure out um ways of getting things done which aren't about one minority imposing their view on everyone else and that's the kind of supposedly strong stable government approach where it's like well we've decided this so it's going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it so that's meant to be decisive but actually it results in poorer decisions and if you bring in the wisdom of everybody and hear from all of the different parties and all of the people they're representing, you get better outcomes that are more sustainable. And I'm talking about durable in the long term and actually environmentally sustainable as well. Thanks a lot, Kleiner. Um, so much clarity there. And obviously, I, 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 along with many other people tonight, are probably wondering what exactly our vote does then in that case. But thank you so much for your contributions. I'm looking forward to you joining us in the Q&A. Uh, now, the next guest is Neil Lawson, who is the chair of the Pressure Group Campus. And he has written many pamphlets uh, for the organization in the themes of, on the themes of democracy and equality. He's author of all-consuming and was co-editor of the Progressive Century. Good evening, Neil, and welcome to the Festival of Debate. Neil, your microphone's muted. <laughs> That's the first one who did it. Hi, hi, I'm the idiot. I get the, the prize, Dunce's prize. Great to be here and great to follow the wonderful Kleiner Jordan, whose work on PR is just kind of exemplary kind of working away working it, and also peter whose work i've admired for a long time from a distance and you know these are two great campaigners and opus has done a brilliant job putting this festival together so well done to everybody it's great to be here Thank you so much. I think you've you've probably just started into the question that I was about to ask you because you've given a reflection on um, Kleiner and Peter's input. So I'll ask you this, what are your uh, reflections on what you've heard so far and your thoughts on democracy in the United Kingdom? Well, I think what Peter and Kleiner have got us into is this notion of crisis. And I wanted to look at this from a kind of big picture view of why the crisis of democracy now and why does it feel so pertinent and what does it mean? Because I think there's something massive going on here. This isn't just about kind of systems um, and the moment and the Tories being bad and the progressive side being divided or whatever else. There's something big going on um, about a systems change. And we've, we live in a world today where we've got the crisis of the pandemic, the crisis of climate, the crisis of inequality, a technological revolution. It's kind of like, you know, the Black Plague, um, the Ice Age and the Industrial Revolution all happening at once. And our democracy is out of time and out of place, not just a bit. PR would help enormously, but the whole nature of our kind of representative democracy is floundering um, in the wake of all of that challenge and all of that change. And in particular, I think it's floundering um, as people use these things, you know, People are now in touch with everyone across the world. They can organize, they can think, they can act. They have a sense of agency uh, in a way that makes our kind of old vote for a, a political party every four or five years feel completely redundant. It's part of the revolution, which I think pushed Brexit over the line. The fact that people weren't, been, weren't being able to take, uh, take control and wanted to take it back. They have a sense of themselves and their, and their place in the world and, that, and they want to be able to have a deeper say. And, and in that Brexit revolution, that was done through a kind of, I mean, I think a retrograde step, but it spoke to the, I think, the deep need for a democratic revolution uh, in our society. And the right know um, that people want this, to have this desire for a deeper uh, democracy. Uh, and they want to destroy the, the potential of that deeper democracy through, through populism to kind of get people to disengage from uh, uh, representative politics or politics and democracy, you know, more generally, to have the odd referendum 
Um, but to you know to keep telling them that political systems and political parties are out of step and out of date and don't matter, and you should jump that, and you should just vote for usually you know the strong person, usually the strong man, and they'll tell you who to hate and who to follow. And that's the politics that they want to put in place. And partly they want to put that in place because they know the alternative is there. They know that in a world of kind of new technology, of global awareness from climate change and the pandemic, that we could have a much deeper global democracy where everyone has a say and everyone has a voice. Um, and as I say, it's much deeper, you know, much more transformative. And it would end up being much more egalitarian, democratic, you know, and hopefully sustainable too. So we're at this point of kind of, you know, a very dark populist future or a brilliant, bright, you know, deeper democracy future. And, and the crisis is that our old democracy isn't allowing us to get there. So we have to refashion it. And maybe you can ask me how we could refashion it. But you can ask me whatever you want because you're in charge. <laughs> how could we refashion it, Neil? <laughs> oh, well, seeing as you ask. So I think, I mean, it's certainly about all the kind of transparency and cleaning cleaning up measures that Peter would advocate. And it is certainly, definitely about proportional representation, which Klein has been talking about. But that only sorts out our old Victorian democracy. And that they are the first steps um, so that we can kind of begin to use the machinery as it exists. Uh, properly, fairly, and cleanly. But then I think we have to go much deeper. And we're beginning to see the elements of that. We're beginning to see deliberative democracy take over. So this is citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries, where people are brought in and asked deep questions. And when you ask people like really deep questions, they're so fantastic. They come up with fantastic, brilliant, progressive answers. And we've seen that in Ireland, and we've seen that in councils in the UK now. So deliberate it's part of evolving power right down um, to, you know, real power down to local and even neighborhood level. And it's also about building a power up to a global level. And I'm sure we've heard about that during the festival, that if taxes are global and climate's global and migration's global, then we've got to start working the, the kind of global systems of democracy. And we have the technology and the awareness to do that. Everyone knows about the pandemic. It's touched everyone across the, the, the globe. It's a huge equalizer. So those levels, but there are even more important levels and ways in which I think we've got to uh, deepen democracy. There's ideas like quadratic voting, which don't just kind of give you a vote, but weigh your vote. So if you feel really strongly about an issue, you can use kind of more of your voting power to vote on the issues that you believe really, really strongly on, just as you kind of spend more money on the things that you believe in and you want you know, to, to happen. So you could with quadratic voting to do that with with um, with democracy. And then you get into the whole kind of liquid democracy thing, which then enables you to kind of, you know, to have a representative, to give someone your vote and your voice, but to take it back from them whenever you want, to pool it with other people, to form a kind of bigger collective. All of this is now possible because of technology and glo global awareness. We just need the structures and the cultures to begin to do it. Because if we don't give people that kind of power, that kind of flexibility, that kind of scope, that kind of ambition in the way they can use their democratic voice, then, then they'll say, well, it's not working. So we might as well go with the populace. Or as I say, tell us who to, who to follow and who to hate. And then it's all simple and easy. So we have to put this democratic architecture in place and give people the platforms, the spaces and the opportunities to express their brilliance. And if we don't do that, the right will win. So I think the stakes are incredibly high in terms of this crisis of democracy. Thank you so much. So much. Uh, there's a lot to unpick there. And a lot of it actually resonates with me. Uh, and I'm sure the Opus team, because we're doing quite a lot of uh, work around uh, liquid democracy and and the likes and, uh, at the moment. But I have to ask, uh, this afternoon you published an article entitled Labour's Big Tent is Over, a progressive campsite is the future. Um, I'm wondering whether any of that has got anything to do with, uh, with the bigger picture you're talking about. So can you tell us a bit about that article and what's led you to write it? Yeah, sure. And, and the two things are connected. So Compass has been pushing the idea of a progressive alliance where people across progressive parties are none come together to work together in the in the kind of negotiated settlements that Kleiner was 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 talking about and we do that for exactly the same reasons because we believe that you know a, a, a green red liberal voice um, and a combination of those things is better than any one of those 
no single party has a, a monopoly of wisdom. So we have to bring all the different progressive elements together to, to meet the challenges of the 21st century. But we also have to bring them together to meet the injustice of our electoral system, the fact that it takes 30 or thousand uh, votes to vote for every Tory MP, but 51,000 for every Labour, 330,000 for every Liberal Democrat, and a ridiculous 850,000 to get Caroline Lucas in, in um, uh, Brighton Pavilion, although she's worth it. I mean, that's just so unjust and so unfair that, it, that we have to change our voting system. But I think the only way we're going to get to change our voting system is through a progressive alliance winning an election between the parties, having a Labour-led government which would enact PR, and then we can have perpetual kind of negotiated, you know, crowdsourced politics um, and not horrible first-past-the-post. So we've been advocating uh, progressive alliance as the way to unlock our democratic and political system so that we can get PR, so that we can get devolved democracy, so we can get deliberative democracy, so we can look at you know experiments in quadratic voting and liquid democracy and all the rest of it. So it's the first step to unlock everything else. Okay, so that's the first step. What are actually the barriers to forming that progressive alliance or come site, if you will, and how can we overcome those? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the barriers are the tribalism that exists in all the parties. And it's understandable at one level. You know, you join a political party because you think it's the answer. Um, uh, but, you know, we're trying to help people understand that where well, you can belong to a political party, uh, the tribes that are always successful in societies are the ones that, that we call open tribes, the ones that work with others, that adapt and build their strength. Um, and, the, you know, that is the barrier that, that, you know, lots of people, some people in some parties would rather keep on losing than work with others. And we've got to show that, you know, that, you know, that just doesn't help. I mean, the Tories have won the last four elections. They're on course to win a fifth if the, if the progressive parties don't work together. Um, and now that, just like the campaign for PR, that's starting to happen in councils across the country in May. Oxfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Milton Keynes, you know, Burnley, Sheffield, across the whole country, uh, you know, people, uh, activists in parties and now council councillors and councillors are coming together and, and forming progressive alliance style administrations. We need to ratchet that up um, uh, to a national level. And we have people like um, Caroline Lucas in the Greens and Leila Moran um, in the Liberal Democrats and Clive Lewis and others in, in the Labour Party that are all trying to work to do this as we try and get people into a place where they recognise we need a 21st century politics of pluralism, negotiation, respect, kindness, compassion, ambition, determination, transformation, and all the rest. So the Progressive Alliance is about all of that. Lovely. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, and I'm pretty sure the people in Sheffield would have liked you, liked you to echo that a little bit more. We're, 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 we're excited about the direction our council has taken at present. So, yeah, thanks for noting that. But um, just something you've touched on a little bit loosely that I would like to, to, to get more of from you. Um, in your view, what policies potentially offer a bridge between progressive voices, for example, proportional representation, universal basic income? Um, yeah, what policies would you, would you consider? Yeah, so I, th I think um, there's a bit of a debate going on and we think that a progressive alliance has to, although PR is absolutely central, if we just make it about PR, then we think it falls over. You know, we found out what happened in 2019 when you try and run an election solely on a constitutional matter, that time Brexit. Um, a general election is always about jobs, it's about the NHS, it's about climate, it's about care, etc. So we can't just do it on PR, I don't think. And I, But I don't think that a progressive alliance should be too complicated and too detailed because we won't get agreement. But what we need to build up is a sense in the country that a better society, a good society, is, is not just feasible and desirable. And you've touched on some of them. So I think there's an easy range of democratic reforms of which PR would be central, but devolution, written constitution, doing something about the second chamber. I think there's something about austerity and poverty that could be done. And there's lots of organisations and, you know, Compass is part of the campaign, along with the, YAP, with the lab, UBI labs around basic income. So there's something around that. There's universal basic services. There's a new settlement around care. There's a kind of Biden-style Green New Deal, which is kind of investing lots of money in good jobs and you know moving to uh, uh, net zero carbon as soon as possible. All the ideas are there, frankly. Um, they just need to be brought together in a narrative and an explanation that's going to really work for the country. But as I say, it's there. It's the you know the politicians' jobs and our jobs to kind of combine that 
and start making that look as seductive as possible for the people of our country. Lovely. So my last question to you so uh, is again, uh, I think it's just a running thread now. Uh, so we've got this, this, this to this place. In your mind, what external shocks or mega trends uh, would make a progressive alliance even more vital? Uh, for example, like the fourth industrial revolution in uh, in machine learning. Um, what do you see before we go? To I, the I think it, yeah, I think it's all there. I mean, I think we all feel it. You know, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's climate, whether it's industrial, whether it's the aging, you know, you know, care pressures on our society. They're all forcing our politics to change at the moment kind of, you know, some people in the political parties are refusing to face up to that, but they will become, you know, they will become overwhelmed by it. And the analogy that I like with this is of uh, uh, the football pitch invasion. You know, when a few fans, and let's think of the new fans being the kind of new, you know, the carriers of the new politics, when a few kind of fans run on the pitch, the stewards can grab them and stop them. But when all the fans run on the pitch and demand the new politics, they can't be stopped. And we're going to overwhelm, you know, Peter with his work, Kleiner with our campaign for PR, people on this call, people around the country in, in, in places, you know, and causes. You know, we're all going to run on the pitch and demand the new politics and no one's going to be able to stop us. Um, and that will be a joyous moment and a joyous time. And that's the basis. That isn't, that isn't the finish point. That's the basis of creating a democracy fit for building a good society. And that's bubbling up everywhere and we're going to make it happen. That's an exciting bubbling that's happening. Thank you very much, Neil. And before we begin audience questions, I would like all the panelists to come back on screen, please. Thank you so much. And I have a question that you should all hopefully be able to, to answer for me before we go to the actual key, uh, questions from the audiences. So given all that we've heard today so far, Kleiner, do we live in a democracy? <laughs> My personal answer is absolutely not. <laughs> okay, thank you. And what about you, Peter? Do we live in a democracy? I guess it's open to academic. I guess it depends on how you what you define as a demo, as your democratic polity. But I think listening to the kind of arguments that Kleiner makes and Neil's very stirring uh, speech there at the end, I think there's clearly a hell of a long way between I think the ideal that we talk about when we talk about democracy and what people experience every day right now. Thank you. Uh, before Neil comes on, I just want to check with the tech team that the questions are getting ready to be popped up on the screen for me after Neil speaks, please. And uh, Neil, do we live in a democracy? Uh, uh, well, I think I, I think we live in. Colin Crouch called it a post-democracy, and mm. I think that's kind of broadly right. I think it has the semblances of a democracy. You know, we go and vote. We have politicians. We go through the kind of you know the routines and the practices of it. It's not real, and it's not it's not meaningful. Um, uh, you know, Bauman said that you know politics and, and power have been separated, and I think that's right. Mm. And all the time that power and politics are separated, Castells talked about placeless power and, and powerless places. Our job is to reconnect power and politics, and that's what we need new structures um, and new cultures to do. And only when we've done that, I think, will we have you know what could be called a real democracy. But democracy is never fixed. It's like the search for a good society. You know, the good democracy is one that knows it's not good enough. Mm. It's always got to be changing and developing, and, and we've always got to be pushing. And the problem is we haven't pushed or changed anywhere near enough for quite a long time, um, and we have to do it now. Otherwise, the populists will win. Absolutely. I think I might have to agree with you on that one, Neil. Uh, I think we should be less reactive and more proactive with our democracy. Um, thank you for that. Thanks for that. So we'll go to the audience questions. Can I have the first question on screen, please? Uh, Reinhard asks, in no way political parties are financed by the state. The argument, parties should serve society. We cannot afford that they are controlled by donors. What does Peter think about this financing approach? Peter. It's a really interesting question, actually, because it's something we never talk about really in Britain. I was really struck when I was writing this book, and we talk a lot about money in politics. We talk about the role of money in politics, where parties get their money. But we don't talk about the fundamental fact that the reason parties need donors is because that's you know we don't have state funding um and i think it's a quite you know it is an interesting question i think one of the arguments against it actually in, in internationally has been that it, oddly but i don't think this works in britain internationally is the idea that it's quite hard for not for incumbents for, for non-incumbent parties so if you're a new party starting up 
the kind of threshold can be quite difficult because there's a great incumbency kind of uh, benefit from being uh, from being an established party. But I still think at the same time, it might be something we could explore. We could explore in ways that are much more creative than just having state funding a party. So for example, if we were doing, as I mentioned earlier, get rid of big donations, make cap donations of 10,000 pounds, we could encourage people to give small amounts of money so, and you, we could match fund it. So you could say donations up to 250 pounds, the government will match fund that say five times. You know, and that would really help. That would make a big difference. And one thing I'm really interested in, I don't know why we don't do it, is to make political party membership tax deductible. You know, that is a really good way of get, encouraging people to join into par, par, politics, of helping political parties, but also doing it in a way that isn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't play on the wariness we have about uh, state funding of parties. You're on mute, you eh? <laughs> That's me now, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Peter. Uh, did anybody else want to have to reflect on that before I bring in the next question? Neil, uh, Kaina, go ahead, go ahead, Kaina. And so, yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on something about money, which everything that Peter's been talking about has, has made me think about. Like, it's it is known that um, first past the post is an excellent voting system for lobbyists. Um, so basically, there's there is a big link between a voting system that pretty much cements normally one but at most two parties in power, um, and it's much much easier for lobbyists to go mm. and talk to those mm. two parties or normally just the one party than it is for them to talk to all of the different parties. And so if you talk to people who work as lobbyists. Um, in, in the EU, they say it's, it's much harder to kind of have this kind of uh, excessive influence because you actually have to go and talk to everybody. There might be a little party, be that the Greens or whoever, who if you haven't actually convinced them, you're not going to get your way. And so it's, it's a safeguarding thing as well. So actually, if all the parties have a say, um, it, it's, it's also true that that has a big impact on whether or not a country goes to war. So first past the post is the single strongest institutional predictor. That's a big mouthful. <laughs> I have to say it carefully because that's, that's the kind of specific thing about it. It's, it's the biggest institutional predictor that a democracy will go to war. And, and that's huge. And we don't even really talk about it very much because people just think, oh, that can't be true. That's ridiculous. It's such a big thing. But actually, um, countries with first past the post, democracies with, with first past the post are more likely to go to war, stay in war, invest in war. Um, so that's also very linked with lobbying as well, because obviously some of the lobbyists are trying to sell stuff to do with war. So um, there's a lot of different connections around that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kleiner. Um, Neil, did you want to reflect on that or shall I yeah, ask? For the just, just, re just really quickly. I mean, you go to countries, you know, Germany, I spend a lot of time in Sweden. You know, they resource their politicians and their political parties very well through the state. And you get better quality decisions. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And it's about the whole legitimization of the political system. That it, it, that it's, it's a necessary part of our, of our democracy and our society. So therefore, it should be underpinned and it shouldn't be just left to, you know, uh, uh, rich amateurs, mm. you know, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about being citizens. It's about a proper formal democracy. It's about, you know, recognising its role and, you know, and paying for it. And when we vote, we know that the vote we cast <laughs> is going to give a certain amount of money to the, you know, the party of our choice. You know, there are problems to get around as Peter, you know, uh, uh, began to set out. But no, it's overwhelmingly a good thing. It won't solve everything, but it's part of the, the jigsaw to get to a better democracy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, as we get the next question up, I would like to ask all our audiences to remember that we're still taking questions. If you could post your questions, whatever platform you're watching from, uh, that would be lovely. So the next question is from, I'm not sure I'm going to, is this Iski or Iski G? So I apologize if I've mispronounced that, but people in power don't give up their power. Those people, these people include, these people include the groups that Peter spoke about, plus the billionaires. How is this power taken away from this complex powerhouse? Uh, who wants to take that first? Peter? Oh, Kleiner, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, 
So I think this is the whole point about democracy, that for centuries we have been gradually wresting pe power away from the powerful. And um, like those who haven't looked at kind of how democracy has developed in this country and in other countries kind of think, oh, well, it's, it's just like this. And oh, yeah, the suffragettes fought to get the vote, didn't they? So then women got the vote. But actually, there's been so many steps along the way where there were some very, very powerful people holding on to everything. And then a little bit was wrested away. So from the king to some nobles and, and then from the nobles to some men and then to some more men and then to some women, women and some more women. And basically, we're, we're on this path to having, and, and I absolutely agree with Neil about democracy is never complete. And actually, a good democracy knows that it's not yet as democratic as it could be. But we're still on this path. And like I said, I don't think we yet have the basic democracy that most democracies already enjoy. But um, the, the way to bring about the change is to get out there and make your voices heard and not to just accept it. And because we're so used to not having the power, to being disenfranchised and not having agency, I think it has a huge impact on, on everything in the country, how people mm. operate. But people think, well, I can't change anything. So what's the point in me trying to change anything? And like our campaign constantly gets people you know, replying on Twitter and whatever. And they're always saying, oh, well, you can't change the system. It's just like, well, if you say that, then that makes it much less likely that we can, because that's one less person who's thinking, yes, we can do something, let's take action. And it's only by taking action and standing up to the powerful that you can actually share the power a little bit more fairly. Thank you, Kleiner. Yeah. Uh, Neil, you had your mouth open. <laughs> yeah, well, I've always, I'm always got my mouth open like a goldfish. Um, uh, mm. good, good question, uh, Iski. Um, and to me, it's all about the notion of countervailing forces. You're absolutely right that some in power will never give up that power without a fight. Um, and so, therefore, it, it is about the countervailing forces that which can begin to, to make change happen. And that's always been the way. We didn't get the 1945 kind of post-war settlement of the welfare state and the NHS and full employment or whatever just because a bunch of people decided it was kind of, you know, there to be had. It, you know, it was done because there was a big, strong, robust working class in, in Britain. It was done because of the threat, the countervailing threat of the Soviet Union. It was done for a number of reasons. And change won't happen now unless there is a class of people. And I'm not convinced that it's just the working class. I think we need a kind of different kind of categorization of what the countervailing forces are. And I think it's the active citizen. It's going to be more the active citizen in the future, which is the countervailing force, which brings back whether that's, you know, online, offline, the kind of things you saw in the squares in Madrid, you know, in New York around, you know, around Occupy, the kind of demonstrations you see with Black Lives Matter, you know, those, those kinds of things. Um, I think XR is a really interesting example of countervailing pressure. Now, I think they're early outriders of, 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 of the kind of people that want to make change happen. What's really interesting about um, XR, and when I see this with Compass as well, that overwhelmingly the people that are really active are kind of middle-aged women who are both willing to put in the time and the effort to put their bodies on the line, uh, to get arrested and whatever else, um, because they want a better world for their grandchildren. So it's kind of what groups are really willing to kind of go out there and make change happen, to demonstrate, to protest, to write, to organize. And I think it's how we bring those together. It, obviously, the democratic process matters, but that's never enough. It's always got to be the ex extra parliamentary stuff as well. And I'm not saying that class doesn't matter and the working class don't matter. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's probably no longer sufficient. And there's going to be other kinds of groupings that we need to look at and other kind of countervailing forces you know, to get the kind of democratic egalitarian and environmental transformation you know that we that we desperately need it isn't just going to come through the ballot box it never does the ballot box really matters but there are external social forces you know that would need to be organized you know as well as that right yeah i'm pretty sure there'll be lots of people intrigued by the idea of active citizenship versus class uh that um, I, I hope i hope people can pass on lots of questions around that uh peter did you want to say anything around this 
No, I just I, like I, I would agree with a lot of what uh, Clean and Neil have said on this. I think it's quite clear. You know, just today we discovered that Microsoft's Irish subsidiary, where basically all their money goes through, made like two hundred and twenty billion dollars in profit and paid no tax. You know, it's quite clear that there's a you know there's the the ba if the battle was if capital versus labor and however you wanted to define labor was the battle. It, you know, that that battle has been now so heavily outweighed in one direction, and I think this idea of of, of active citizenship is really interesting. I think we are seeing the emergence of a lot of people that wouldn't necessarily into traditional ideas of class, but, you know, precarious workers. We're seeing, I think, a, we're, the extent to which across the piece, at the moment, I think we have a government that has done a very good job of making it seem like they are on the side of people who are against this um, and people who, who want a fairer system. And I think, you know, the challenge, I guess, for people, Many people on this call is how do you build an alliances that that change that, you know? And I think, but it's quite clear that this is not the view of the majority. If you look at America, where this is the you know, it, many times it is useful to look at America to think where Britain might go because we do have a tendency to go there. I think in many in many respects. And if you look at America, where you had the Republican Party, which was the party of you know, literally the party of plutocrats for very many years, and it still is the party of plutocrats, and it still draws lots of money from plutocrats. But it's it's been run by the by the people of Donald Trump, and I think that's really important. I think we need to learn lessons from that as well, and to understand that that's changing. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, can we have the next question on the screen, please? Uh, Colin Miller asks. Given the use of dark money to campaign against uh, proportional representation in the coalition government referendum, should there be a referendum for PR in the future, proportional representation in the future? Uh, do you want me to speak to that? It's, oh, sorry. <laughs> You're the PR person, sorry. Okay. Oh, Peter, you started, yeah. Well, just, I, it is where I wrote my book, I did write at length, but this is the alternative vote, which isn't quite PR, and Clean will have more to say on the alternative vote. But it is quite remarkable if you look back. I went back into the annals of 2011, and the Brexit campaign was really a mirror image of the alternative vote campaign with the exact same people, led by the same people, with the same policies, the same strategies. The whole nine yards, it's quite remarkable. It was only when I went back into the archives to look it up, I was really struck by it so yeah it's it's quite clear it's quite i just thought it was really interesting that the people who were lining up against any form of proportionality in politics were very much the same people who went on to uh, bankroll the brexit referendum yeah may i come in yeah go ahead Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Peter's absolutely right. Um, AV is not PR. <laughs> this is one of our first social media hashtags. Um, the alternative vote is a different voting system to the one we use, but it's not proportional. And so it suffers from a lot of the same problems as our current system. Um, but it, it was a kind of uh, maybe a compromise too far in the fact that that was what was offered in the referendum and, and people had been calling for PR and they were offered something else. And it's, of course, now used as a great excuse by uh, MPs who don't want PR to say, well, we had a referendum on that, so um, we, we don't need to discuss it anymore, which is nonsense. So it's like saying, um, do you want this red apple or this green apple? And actually a person wants a banana. So <laughs> no, I don't want the other color apple. I want the banana. It's a completely different thing. Um, and yeah, so a lot of the benefits of uh, the, that come with PR are about the proportionality specifically. And so it's probably worth touching a little bit on voting systems, which we generally try to avoid. But that's basically what I want to say, that there are lots of different ways of achieving proportional representation. And um, there's broadly two kind of categories. Um, but the point is that it results in better outcomes. That's, that's the bit that we need to stay focused on. And in order to help people stay focused on that and on taking action for PR, we um, spent a year and a half brokering what we call the Good Systems Agreement, which was signed by all the opposition parties aside from Labour, lots of Labour MPs, lots of organisations, um, lots of public figures. And it basically sets out the principles of good voting systems, um, of which proportionality is key. But it also says that the best way to choose a voting system is through a citizen-led deliberative process, like a citizens' assembly. So the um, the, the MPs and other uh, people in power shouldn't get to choose the system that they're elected on. And one of the reasons that we said that it should be a citizens' assembly type deliberative process rather than a referendum is because actually, while referendums are a great democratic tool when done properly, 
when not done properly, they kind of exacerbate all of the problems we currently have with our democracy. So at the moment, our democracy is really vulnerable to uh, excessive influence of money. And 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 so it, if you then have a referendum where you can totally sway the result with a load of money, that's not really the decision of the country. That's the decision of people who are more able to put more posters up on the underground and stuff. And that's a lot actually what happened with the AV referendum, <laughs> these huge billboards in the underground saying, well, do you want money spent on a new voting system or do you want this baby in an incubator to survive? Because, you know, otherwise the baby's going to die. <laughs> this is like this is completely irrelevant but you, you've got yeah. a very emotive campaign there which you've got the money for and it sways it so yeah i think um let's only do referendums once we've got the rules in place to do them well not a fan i see <laughs> uh yeah uh neil shall i go ahead to the next question or did you want to say anything on that no, I, I, yeah, just quickly. I mean, I think it does highlight the, the, the really difficult thing of trying to build a new democracy out of a rotten old democracy. Um, because as people have said, you know, referendums can just be kind of bent and distorted. Um, I mean, it does remind me that they're much better at winning referendums than we are. I mean, it's not just a question of money. It's a question of kind of mm. ruthlessness and ambition and cleverness as well. I mean, they're, they're much cleverer than us when it comes to kind of how you win this kind of thing. Um, because they keep doing it, you know. They got they 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 stop democracy happening like AV, but they also win change referendums like Brexit. You know, they can do it both ways round, and that's that's really impressive. And we've got to get a lot more impressive about how we communicate and how do we get to the kind of you know the soul of some of these issues, which the emotion of some of these issues, you know, in ways because we put up rational facts and figures, and they never do that. And I think we've got to get a lot smarter in the way that we campaign and think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we've exhausted that one for now. Uh, next question, please. James Locke asks, is power more easily grasped locally than nationally? And does this offer the most direct route to sustain systemic change? I'll start with you, Neil, this time. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I mean, democracy, clearly, if it's kind of really tangible and really local, um, it's, you know, you're more likely to get engaged. You're more like, if it's a local planning decision, it's about a local school, it's about a local community organization, et cetera, et cetera. It's more tangible and it's easier to find the people. And so you can understand why a lot of democracy, you know, happens at a local level, at a neighborhood level. And there's lots of energy and interest in that. Um, uh, there's a kind of new movement for neighborhood democracy that's coming out of you know, Sheffield and the, and the Centre for Welfare and others, you know, and I think all of that's really exciting and interesting. My worry about that is, is not, you know, that, that should, you know, flourish and, and, and I can see why, but, you know, but power isn't just local. Um, it isn't, you know, it isn't siloed. It is national. It is global. It is international. And we can't pretend that we can change everything, you know, from the local because we can't. Um, is that, you know, that's the, the kind of, you know, term that you used to, you know, uh, People resilient like that you know resilience is just kind of hunkering down and trying to protect yourself against you know the weather that you can't control well i want to control the weather i want the people to control the weather and control the local the national and the global and i think it's got to be done at you know at every level and the notion that people are just in their neighborhood or in their street you know uh, they are mostly physically but on the internet in their minds you know uh, across lots of their life they're at least national and most, you know, and very often international. We our reach now digitally and emotionally is enormous, you know, as unprecedented. We've never been in this position as human beings where we have this notion of scale, of connectivity, of globalism. You know, and that has got to be the kind of foundations for a not just a local democracy, you know, but a global one. And it has to be done at both ends. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Neil. Uh Kleiner, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, I, as usual, I agree with Neil, um, but I think I want to flag up what I mentioned earlier about the binary nature of our politics. So this question, like, should we focus on the local rather than national because maybe it's easier to change? I think actually it's equally hard to change, but also for me it's generally 
X and Y rather than one or the other. We have this kind of democ democracy that um, because of first past the post, you end up with these kind of two big tribes which are against each other. And so it's kind of red or blue, in or out, yes or no, black or white. And that that's not the reality of life. Life isn't binary. I mean, yes, we can use binary code to do a lot of clever things, but that's a sequence of binary things. But actually, um, it, it, why why not both? Like let let's let's do it all. And so we've got local groups pushing for PR locally as well as pushing for PR nationally. I mean, our campaign focuses on the House of Commons because that is the, the centre of power supposedly so let's let's actually use use the house of commons which is meant to be sovereign and and, and let's change that so we're all sharing power thank you kleiner uh am i good to go ahead uh to the next question peter yeah next question please uh patrick asks okay briefly uh labor will never agree to cross-party alliance which includes the scottish national party because it means giving up in scotland which they should do because Scotland has given up on them. Uh, so that's the comment. Do you want to reflect on that, any of you? Yeah, I've, I've written quite and thought of quite a bit about this because I think it's a big issue in obviously in British politics that you know support for Scottish independence doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So what do we do about that? Um, ultimately, I think we have to believe that you know countries and people have the right to self determine. And if there's a continued kind of majority in the polls and in, in the, the Scottish Parliament, you know, and they're returning an overwhelming number of, 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 of MPs to, to London, that there ought to be um, a second referendum. Um, but I think the question is about when and how that referendum happens. I don't think it should be another yes, no referendum like Brexit and the first referendum, because I don't think that gives people enough information. I think there should be a broad set of principles and, and, and direction of travel to what independence would be, what would you do about currency, what would you do about trade, what would you do about the border, etc. So people, you know, unlike Brexit, knew something about what they were voting for. Um, uh, so I think it should be pushed down. I mean, the re you know, the reason I think I think that um, is partly because you know I want a progressive alliance, and a progressive alliance government is going to rely on fifty or so SM SNP. MPs to kind of you know give it give it life, um, so I think there's a kind of political reality, an electoral reality, and a kind of justice reality that says that they should have another vote if those majorities continue. But it should happen you know in in that kind of way. And I think the Labour Party you know can fight for um, the union. And I think a third option should be on a ballot paper of what what a federal Britain you know would look like, so people could have broadly the status quo a properly federal Britain and independence. And all of that is about having conversations with people, surely. You know, the, the Labour Party should be talking to the SNP about those issues, you know, and having a proper conversation um, and not, you know, and not pretending that somehow the SNP, they're a hugely kind of progressive, you know, party, just as progressive as the Labour Party. You know, the difference is they've got different ideas about how to get to the good society. One thinks, you know, it can only be done through independence. The other thing can only be done through the union. It's not where they want to get to, it's how they get there. So I think there's plenty of room for conversation. It's going to have to happen. We're going to, we can't pretend that it isn't there. Um, and people, as always, you know, are going to have to talk because that's the only way. And the sooner that happens in this parliament, you know, the better. So you don't get to a general election where the Tories can say, you know, uh, Starmer in Sturgeon's pocket or whatever they did with Miliband and Salmon before, that we lance that ball because they're going to do it. The Tories are going to say that. If you vote Labour, you're going to get the SNP, whether they're talking or not. So we might as well talk and show that we can do mature, grown-up politics, however difficult that is. It's tricky ground, but it's got to be done. Right. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you very much. Um, any further reflections or shall we move on? Next question, please. What does independent media need and from whom to offer a robust counterpoint to corporate media's detrimental effect on democracy in the UK? I'll pass that on to you first, Peter. It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I think it's, and it's a very important one, I think. I think understanding and engaging with the media landscape 
is really important to understand how we where we are and how we got here and what might change. You know, it's easy for me to say, yes, yeah, subscribe and read outlets like Open Democracy, The Ferret, which I found in Scotland as well. Like there's there is a thriving, you know, an interesting. We're seeing a lot of interesting things happening in, in the edges of media too, like ownership issues, like the ferret's a cooperative, we have the Bristol Cable, it's a cooperative, open democracy is increasingly works for and was run by the people who subscribe to it yeah you know, so there is there is opportunities on on the margins and we're seeing like i think in many ways a very flourishing alternative media space but i think there is also a real need to kind of engage with and understand how the media is now and i think it's going unfortunately i think it's going to get worse as well in the coming years i think we're going to see even more of an assault on public service broadcasting which has at times done really good jobs and important jobs whether it's channel four which i think is in huge danger of being privatized soon for no real reason beyond ideology we're already seeing a huge cutback in public interest journalism at the bbc we're seeing across the piece like a retrenchment of what was investigations in lots of other places as well and lots of other media outlets so i think it is really i think it is kind of incumbent on people to take ownership you know it, i think you know i'm somebody who started off in what we might call the mainstream media now work for open democracy and i do think it is really important to kind of think okay how can we own a media system that's going to work for all of us and not just be you know, kind of controlled by a very small number of hands. And that is the case in Britain, you know, especially when it comes to print. And I think this is the real thing as well. Like, you know, in Britain, it's easy to forget that, that yes, broadcast is, is regulated by Ofcom. I think we're going to see a lot more changes there as well with this with GB News, a kind of hard right wing for, version of, of television. But also print, re, which isn't regulated, really does have a huge sway on where broadcast goes. And print newspapers are owned by a handful of people, really. You've got Rupert Murdoch and you've got a couple of big uh, media groups who own them. And the, the outsized impact they can have on what happens and what doesn't happen, I think is, is really, really, really important. I think we do all need to understand that. And I do think part of the story is about trying to build and support alternative uh, media ecosystems because in reality i think the the media system could look very very different even just in five or ten years time thank you peter uh anything to add to that kleiner i think no no thank you very much uh, i'm going to ask a question and then i'll ask for reflections on democracy in a moment so my question is is really around um, um, what's your vision of a society that has truly built back better after the pandemic? Yeah, go ahead, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I saw uh, that. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, uh, you know, um, uh, this has, you know, as terrible and as awful and as, you know, as much as people have, have suffered and my heart goes out to everyone that, that, that has, this does present, you know, an opportunity, you know, that, that we've realised that, you know, how much the most vulnerable in our society, you know, suffer, how weak they were, how near to the breadline, you know, how unhealthy they were, how much they're pro... Uh, exact. We found out, you know, how much we're interconnected you know, as a country, you know, uh, as a globe, we found out what happens when we, you know, we, we mess with stuff, um, you know, that, that we shouldn't be messing with. And, you know, how we, you know, however this thing was created, it was either created in a laboratory or it was created because we're messing with the environment, you know, in ways that we shouldn't do. It's been an amazingly kind of horrid but revealing exercise in human existence. And therefore, it's got to mean that it's a time for us to reflect and think about who we are and what we are and what kind of lives do we want to, to live, you know. And the upside of a lot of that has been the kind of, you know, the joy of, you know, meeting, you know, your neighbours and being part of, a, you know, local, you know, uh, uh, infrastructures of, you know, of, of support, of getting used to your place, um, uh, of, of, you know, of, of recognising the beauty of walking around a park and not just getting on, you know, an aeroplane. There's so many things that have happened over the last year that I think will come, you know, get deep into our soul. And our politics has to begin to, to reflect that, you know, and build on that, you know, and we can come up with policy descriptions, but it's a kind of, it's the emotive kind of so soulful, hopeful thing that will, that will, that, you know, that will really last. I mean, I say that, and then we found, you know, we found very practical things, like all of a sudden there was a magic money tree after all. And that we could spend lots of money and and not you know destroy 
you know, the economy. And we could go on doing that, you know, for a lot longer. So there are so many things that we've discovered over, over the last, last 18 months that give us the chance to rebuild, you know, in a different kind of way for a different kind of future. Um, so let's try and build the politics and the democracy that can unlock that and unlock and unleash that kind of very different kind of future. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Kleina. Thank you. Um, so I think if we are genuinely going to build back better, then we need to be able to take the the, the best of both. So um, a lot of things have obviously changed with the, the pandemic and um, uh, we've we've lost things that are really valuable, like human connection um, through a lot of it. Um, but then there have obviously been uh, ways where, where people have connected more as a consequence of it. But I think if we can take the things that we've developed, the positive things from it, um, whilst uh, going back to some of the things that are positive, then then that would be for the best. I mean, it's it's been a, a massive tragedy, like globally, but particularly nationally, that people have suffered so much more than they needed to. If you compare how the UK has done compared to other developed nations, it's it's just horrifying and. Um, so maybe we can't say, oh, well, that's definitely about democracy. But personally, my, my feeling is that it is because we've got an unaccountable minority in charge. And I always kind of hasten to add, this isn't an anti-Tory thing. Everyone should be represented fairly. Um, but we can't have just one, one group normally in charge that only rep represent a, a minority. Um, and so whilst this has been a tragedy, um, also, I think, like as Neil was alluding to, like there is value in the fact that we've had a bit of a pause and a reset. And if we can do that for COVID, we can do it for the climate crisis. If we can stop planes from flying, I'm not saying we should stop all planes from flying, but like we, we can do those kind of really big things globally. And it's that kind of concerted effort that we need if we are going to avert the climate catastrophe. And we've got less than 10 years now before what the scientists say is like the kind of key tipping point where we're really not going to be able to make enough change to survive and and for other species to survive and and so for me this is why i care about democracy so my background is in environmental activism and we cannot make the changes that we need to quickly enough while we're constantly fighting uphill like it's a losing battle against those in, in power and yes we can make little changes and we make significant wins sometimes but actually if we just had a government <laughs> that represented the people like most people want to take fast action on the climate crisis so if if we actually had that representation we could bring about the changes that we need so i think let's let's learn from the strategy that we, we, we've gone through we're going through and yeah as you say really build back better <laughs> absolutely thank you so much uh peter a reflection on that as well if you have any um... yeah just well i did one thing i think has been really striking over the last 15 months is a lot of the assumptions we had about how people behave have been proven to be quite incorrect you know if you think back 15 months ago when this started we were we couldn't possibly have a lockdown because you know we'd never do that it's fine for people in southeast asia but we would never do that and, and that's been the case throughout and even today we're talking ad nauseum about red lists and green lists and amber lists and portugal and if you if you survey people most people don't intend to go on a foreign holiday and have no intention of doing so and they think it's a it is an unhealthy thing to do in terms of public health at the moment. People are much further ahead than government in a lot of issues. And there's a lot of reasons why government might be there. And I think airlines is a good example of, of interest in the airline industry, etc. But a lot of people at almost every stage of this, people have understood. People have seen, actually have been far ahead of government, have seen the science, have seen, and also just understood themselves and are willing to make sacrifices for public health. And I think it's actually remembering the public and public health and, and this should be a real wake-up call for all of us but especially to actually go there's opportunities here too people do not necessarily always behave as the homo economicus that we think that they do and so that's the one big thing I, I i'd like to take away from this and i think if we think about that there's lots of other potentials that we could you know when and if this starts to end there's lots of things we could do really differently 
Well, thank you very much, Neil, Kleiner, and Peter. This has been very informative. Uh, so we've been talking democracy in crisis. Um, thank you so much again for joining us to all our audiences. And also uh, remember to go to the Festival of Debate website. We've got one more activity, might be two. And and uh, we, we are running uh, for the rest of the weekend, I believe. So if you could visit us. But thank you again and good night. For, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.